Welcome to Lifting Your Spirit, a monthly broadcast in which we interview people about their spiritual lives and how they suggest sharing that with others. I'm Reverend Joel Grossman, Interfaith Minister, Director of Spiritual Services for Constellation Hospice, and I also offer spiritual coaching virtually on a donation basis. And I'm Ted Jones, a meditation teacher at North Shore Insight Meditation Center. Our show is based on the following assumptions, four of them. One, everyone is spiritual. Sometimes we are conscious and active regarding our spirituality, sometimes not. But even when we're not, we still have a spirit. Second. There are many ways to lift your spirit, not just through religious practice, but through nature, art, relationships, service to others, just to name a few. Three, each person's spiritual path is unique and may change in small or large ways over time. And fourth, that it's important to respect your own spiritual journey trusting that one step will lead to the next, and also to respect the unique spiritual journey of other people, even though it may be very different from your own. We're not here to convince you of the benefits of any particular path or method, but really just to give you some food for thought. Today, we're very pleased to have as our guest Ziggy Rindler Bregman, uh, who has been a decades long teacher in arts and community, arts education and community activism in Santa Cruz, where she lives. She worked to restore music and arts education in the city's public schools, co founded Stone Soup, a arts. Uh, a journal of children's writing and art, and helped launch a regional land trust. Ziggy is a founding member and leader of an interfaith contemplative community called Sangha Shantivaum, which focuses on the study of all the world's religious, uh, all the world's wisdom traditions. She is a poet and visual artist working primarily in drawing and painting, interested in landscape as both place and gateway to inner life. She has exhibited her work widely and is included in many private collections. Ziggy has published two collections of poetry and art. The first, The Gate of Our Coming and Going, and more recently, her newest book, into the Thicket, a collection of poetry and art. So welcome, Ziggy. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Thank you so much. We, we always like to begin by uh, asking our guests to talk about their kind of spiritual history, their journey, right back from uh, the early days of childhood, as, 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 as far as you can remember, right up to the present. So... Well, how has that been for you over all these years? Well, thank you. I think that's so true. Everyone's journey is so unique. Um, I grew up in LA in a great big Catholic family, nine kids, went to Catholic schools. Um, definitely a leap formation for me was attending um, a very liberal uh, all girls Catholic high school in Los Angeles called Immaculate Heart. And it was at the time that Vatican II had just you know, uh, recessed and the sisters there when I was a freshman were in complete habit. And by the time I got through those four years, they, they looked like me, you know, they were oh. women of the world. And I was immersed in um, actually in the arts at Immaculate Heart, Sister Corita, many of your guests may know of the um, silkscreen artist um, who taught at the college, the art department was in the uh, basement of the high school and her you know, exuberance for the arts and spirituality was definitely a formation for me. 
I then went to UC Santa Cruz um, and it was, you know, a chance to sort of step out of the Catholic bubble. It was the first time I met people that were, you know, outside my tradition. And I ended up marrying um, a man who I've been with for nearly 50 years, who was a grad student there in astronomy, um, who's Jewish. I was married by a rabbi and a Jesuit. So that was, you know, a turn. Um, and you know, we raised our family with, you know, again, on the spiritual journey, the inter weaving this interfaith um, idea uh, from the very beginning. Um, and then another big turn for me was, um, I, would, I was involved in local parish life, um, but a big turn for me was when uh, a monk from New Kamadali Herbitage down in, in Big Sur came to teach uh, well, actually, he came on a sabbatical, but he ended up teaching in Santa Cruz. And by the time his six-week class was over, where he was exploring this idea of the universal call to contemplation um, and was beginning to write a book about that, he was done after six weeks. And, and a number of us said, you can't stop because we finally thought, wow, we're really finding some connection here between spirit, soul, and body. You know, an introduction to yoga. I began to take yoga. He um, started a small sangha, which um, we still have. We still have going. I was involved in a lot of interfaith work, um, and then another turn for me was going on retreat up at Redwoods Monastery in the north, Cal Northern California, with a group of Cistercian sisters, and learned that that's where Thomas Merton had actually stopped uh, in and out over time, and the contemplative life became more and more. Um, a, a part of my life. Um, so I found my way over to the Santa Cruz Zen Center, all this time kind of in and out the door of the traditional Catholic um, practice and study deeply the teachings of the Buddha and uh, wonderful teachers over there. And this, this continues to unfold all this time. Um, my you know, art and writing was going. I I had a recent period which I called my holy disorder. Um, <laughs> and maybe some of your guests can relate to that, where suddenly organized religion was bugging me. You know, especially with the role of women in the Catholic Church. You know, um, you know, I had a niece asking me if I would marry her and her you know fiance, and so went off and got my universal life you know credentials to to perform the ceremony. So anyway, that's a long answer to my spiritual journey. It's still unfolding. Joel? So you use the expression holy disorder. Yeah. Um, was that related at all to a dark night of the soul? Well, uh, yes, absolutely. Because when I realized that I could not contain myself. I mean, honestly, I was sitting in the pew, I heard something preached and I spoke out loud, <laughs> just kind of, you know? And I thought, I mean, it was definitely spirit driven, but I just thought, okay. I, I think we want a little more detail here. <laughs> uh, maybe not, um, but anyway, <laughs> um, actually what happened, okay, the detail was I got cut off. It was like, uh -huh. uh, cause I had a question. I said, hold on, wait. And you don't usually do that when someone's giving a homily, right? And mm -hmm. after the uh, mass, I went out in the front steps and I asked the presiding priest what I wanted to ask was, and you know, I just got psh. so cut you off again. Oh yeah. So I I thought you know what I'm done with this, and I I said I can't do this anymore. My kids were pretty surprised, and I for three years. I didn't attend mass and I would go down to the ocean with my, with my um, give us this day, a, a reverie, a daily practice and, you know, sing the Psalms and, and read scripture. And I was also part of a small, <laughs> and then zoom happens, you know, COVID happens. Uh, but this was before COVID we started Alexio Divina on zoom and we're still going. So I found my community, my Sangha was still going, but then I had to sort of start wrestling with, what are the sacraments? And that became important to me as well. So yeah, it was definitely a dark night because I felt lost. I, I was suddenly, wait a minute, if not this, what? Oh. Mm. I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, backtracking a little bit to uh, when you got married and 
and had kids that my uh, my father my mother was a catholic my father uh, was not um, when they got married back in those days um the non-catholic had to verbally guarantee that the kids would be raised catholic did that was that still going on when, when well you... yeah and we kind of <laughs> jesse and i kind of snuck under the radar because we had a very liberal priest who recognized that you know jesse was more i mean he was a um you know had his bar mitzvah he was raised in a kind of a north not completely orthodox kind of borderline orthodox jewish family and but it wasn't that important to him and and so it was kind of like yeah yeah we're what we told him was we're going to let our kids make their own decision they Ooh, will have their wow. own spiritual journey well and then that has still that's still unfolding because when my firstborn was about in seventh grade i realized you know we could celebrate passover we could celebrate christmas but those were like the holidays the holy days yeah. but what are the teachings and how do you get to that so his journey is his own. He was actually in eighth grade, went through a, a program for teens and decided to be baptized. He could have easily gone to the temple. I was fine with that. I just wanted him to have some spiritual journey. <laughs> you know, my daughter, uh, she wanted to hang out with her friends and they were all in a teen youth Christian something. And she went for about two months and said, this is stupid. And <laughs> so she didn't have anything to do with it. And my youngest son just kind of observes and you know he's he's uh, there are all great humans and um they tell me i'm not a normal catholic and that's true <laughs> well uh, that is it's 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 fascinating to me i mean that that really is bringing a sort of interfaith into the family and and allowing the kids to make their their own choices and they'll know? see by your actions i mean they know who i am you know and yeah, a lot of theology and astrophysics around our kitchen table. Oh, yes. So you, you're um, sharing beautifully um, about the religious path to spirituality, but you have two other strong paths and maybe some more, um, <laughs> art and poetry. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about how those enter the mix? Definitely. You know, I think as a child, growing up in a big family is not easy. I mean, it's a lot of fun and there's always someone to play with, but there's also lots of teasing and lots of, um, yeah, it, it's complicated big families. And I think as a child, I, there was a contemplative side to me and it was hard to find. Um, so my little sneaking up into the tree, you know, for my quiet time or into the fuchsia bush or sitting on the front steps with a sketch pad drawing the house across the street were places of refuge. And um, it continued to kind of unfold for me. And then, you know, I, I took art classes. And as I said, my high school was incredibly saturated with the arts, but then there's a lot of identity issues. And I, I, I what, didn't claim artist or writer. And at UC Santa Cruz, um, I ended up in the arts college taking art classes. But again, I was very intimidated by people I thought were real writers and real artists. And it wasn't until after college that I started to really pursue my own um, uh, work and find my voice both in the visual arts and in writing. There was a, an art teacher at our local community college and I took a drawing class after college. And um, Howard Ikamoto said to me, you know, you have a mark, keep drawing. There's a unique and beautiful mark that you have, keep drawing. And it was very encouraging. And so there I went, you know, and and then, you know, you're raising a family and trying to find time, but always uh, I would get up early to write. Uh, I would take workshops as a way to kind of immerse myself in the work. And it's probably only been in the last maybe 15 years that I started to really make the connection that this was God's work. This was spiritual work that I was, the way I was living and observing what I was observing, what I was experiencing was in parallel with my own inner life. And so to inhabit a place, to go into, hike into the Sierra 
and you know observe the way a river was moving that's what a poet does that's what an artist does and then putting them together and say oh this might benefit the world put it out into the world beautiful yeah and it's and it's it's work you know it's um you know people say oh how long did it take to write that poem and i say well i'm 71 <laughs> that's how long it took you know um it yeah these are this is a process for sure yeah that's a great description of the spiritual journey and it has so many facets that you're bringing in to get yourself to 71 <laughs> yeah and and this um i this idea that we begin to understand the gift of being older is the presence of God infused in everything, everywhere, every moment. And it's not necessarily inside a shrine, you know, the whole world is a shrine, you know, mm. and yet, you know, we have identified holy places, sacred places, um, but I've begun to understand that, you know, the more I look, the more I see. And and Jesse, actually, my husband, who, you know, is definitely on his own spiritual journey. We were um, snowshoeing up in the, in the uh, Sierra a few years ago and had hiked up to Lake Winnemucca, which is on a, a pass. And it's um, not many people were back in there. In fact, nobody was back in there when we were there. And I said, let's just sit here. There's nothing like, you know, the silence of snow that i mean it's just it's a deafening silence and he's not used to he doesn't have that kind of meditation life that i do and it was so beautiful it was communion all its own to sit with my husband on a winter day in the absolute quiet of the snow mm. the presence of god it was a holy place beautiful um interested in in uh, going a little bit more deeply into into the uh, the sort of nuts and bolts of the the process of your uh creativity uh that uh, I was very pleased to be able to read your latest book in into the thicket which I think is visible in back of you on the shelf there uh, uh, yeah. the um there it is <laughs> and uh, it's a beautiful collection of poems and uh, reproduction of, of, of your paintings, drawings, and that it's laid out in a way so that the poem is accompanied by the drawing and, and vice versa, and vice versa. And I'm uh, really interested in... Uh, hearing about the kind of the the synergy between uh the two of them you know it's sort of like uh are they ever kind of created at the same time does one inspire the other or do they kind of hook up sort of later in life um, <laughs> and that's a great question ted um you know it's so different from my first book which um i had this collection of poems and I'd been doing you know art but I I realized oh I want to respond to these poems so I took the poems as kind of a prompt and then I made a series of prints I selected out of you know 50 poems 15 to do prints from so that was what I did eight years ago mm -hmm. this book into the thicket was very different in that um it, it, it's almost like the book of hours you know it's it's over a period of seasons of life, both in nature and in my family um, and where I am today, uh, I was writing and I was painting. Um, an example, you know, certainly during um, COVID, actually the first summer COVID in Santa Cruz, we had this massive fire and um, I was writing about it and I was painting about it. And so those were done simultaneously. Um, other uh, images in this book, Into the Thicket, were culled from ver from different experiences. There's some poems about being in, in Italy, inspired by a, 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 fres a fragment of a fresco that I saw. And then I was 
in artist residency and I was kind of collaging some of the, uh, that, I uh, don't know if I want to tell you the nuts and bolts of how that was made, but um, anyway, so they were really concurrent. Mm. Uh, and the graphic designer that I worked with to put this book together, my dear friend, Eva Bernstein is also an artist and made her living as a graphic designer. She knows my work. And when I brought these poems together, um, we started matching them up. And I also worked with an editor who helped me kind of shape the book. There are four sections to it um, and how the poems flowed because a book is like choreographing it for me, it's like choreographing a dance. You know, it, there's a beginning, like how do people come begin, come into your work and then where you're taking them and, and, and what's, what's the last poem in the book? What are you leaving them with? So, and mm. that was both images and, um, and poetry. Yeah. So I did, there's a, a number of images that were in series. Like I, I tend to work in series. So there's a whole series that were done during COVID in the book. There was a whole series done on an artist residency. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yeah. it does. Okay. And then the mm -hmm. follow-up question that I had, sorry to interrupt you there, Joel. Follow-up question is kind of how does your formal practice of meditation, prayer, um, fit with the art and the writing that you're doing? I mean, for instance, do you always meditate or practice a, a prayer form before doing it? Or uh, are, 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 is it less kind of related than that? Or maybe more related than that? Maybe it feels like one is actually not any different than the other it, it's starting to feel more one thing um i'm i'm really very privileged in that i have a space in my home which is a studio where i also have my meditation space and i mm. did that a number of years ago where i realized my art was my spiritual practice and that all belonged at the same time in the same place and so i have a little altar in my zafu and um, that and I have my practice of sitting zazen there. Um, when I work, when I'm painting or drawing or printing, or when I'm writing, you know, I always feel like I'm walking into kind of a sanctuary. Like you know, sometimes in my morning practice mm -hmm. after zazen, I mean, always in my morning practice after zazen, I do um, I do morning prayer, and I always light an incense and I always do an offering, and so there's a residue of kind of the fragrance yes. of incense in my studio. So anytime I walk in there, it, you know, I bow, you know, it's already a holy place. Mm. I probably, I don't, um, I don't necessarily like if I'm going to go in and start noodling around and drawing, go, okay, this is prayer. But I, I mean, it's, it's still evolving, you know, <laughs> I, yes. I, I, I'm yes. maybe not conscious of it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, I, I was wondering if you'd be willing to share one or two or maybe more of the poems and the drawings. Yes, I'd love to. And one of the things that's really fun about uh, this book that I did is I love to read my work. And so I'm delighted to be able to do that. That in the back of the book, I actually have a QR code, which means that I have about six poems that I read that are recorded um, with music. Um, and so it's, it, it becomes very alive. I don't know if Joel, um, I think you got a chance to see the book or if Ted, you were able to listen yeah. to any of those, yeah. but, um, yeah. And always there's just so many different poems to choose, but I, I'd like to read actually the, um, the signature poem to this book, which is called Into the Thicket. And this was written, um, while on a writing residency up near Petaluma in Northern California. Into the thicket. I want to live like the bluebird, offer my flash of brilliance, then disappear into the woods, song melodic, lilting. I want to say what needs to be said, like honk of gander, cluck of dame, or gentle patter of rain pinging my kitchen window. I want to know when to close it. 
I want to walk in this downpour, face stinging with joy, past the furthest farmhouse, the sheep, goat, and rooster. I bow to drenched field. Here, I follow the deer who leaps into the thicket, drinks from the hidden stream. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and the image that accompanies it, I, I, I think we'll, we'll share as well. And, um, you know, I mentioned um, this <laughs> hike up into the Sierra with Jesse hmm. um, sitting in the snow. Well, there was another hike up in the Sierra, which turned out to be a very challenging uh, experience. And um, I'm going to share this poem with you as well. Its title is Come Down, Lie Down Here. Who can breathe at this altitude? We come down from that high Sierra Lake, stop for shade, water, and a handful of almonds. Midday, you see stars and tell me what is strange. On the felled ponderosa pine, we sit side by side and uneasy rest. This is bad. This is really bad, you tell me. From nowhere, your deep-throated moan, your limbs quake, you shudder, collapse in my arms. I hold you, thinking it is death. Only the wind and a sweetness surrounds, steadies my heart. All I can do is hold you. Later, you tell me you think it is just a dream when I bend over to kiss your parched lips cracked open, plead with you beneath the blue sky dome. Oh. That was a holy moment for sure. I mean, you know, that presence of the holy, I will never forget. I was completely held in this sweetness. And I actually thought my husband had died. As it turns mm. out, he had fainted. <laughs> and the, the, the end of that story was that we were there. Oh, there was an angel who came, actually. It was a woman who had come about when we were sitting on that log, came up the trail with her family. She was a retired doctor and, you know, he said, oh, how are you doing? Well, he's not feeling so well. And she says, oh, well, you have you doing a drink of water? And here's, you know, I'm a doctor. You know, if you need anything, just, you know, let me know. And when Jesse was feeling worse, I told my son who was with us, go get that doctor. And she came down and we ended up calling for emergency lift. And he got to have a helicopter ride to the hospital. And it turns out he was fine. It was a acute case of dehydration and um <laughs> anyway oh golly but the holy was there for sure the holy was there and um just what you were uh saying about the holiness the, the presence of the divine in that in that moment um you and i just had a very brief email exchange where i was talking about you know the grief uh, kind of being the flip side of joy in some way and that 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 poem really captures that essence that there's two things can be going on at once you know that the the uh, powerful grief that your husband may be dying in your arms and yet the uh, uh incredible expansiveness of the being held by the divine in this extraordinary physical location yeah yeah absolutely and and then oh my goodness how to get that into a poem you know and how many writes and rewrites and you know there's the there's the story but a poem is not a story you know the poem is to try to get to the feeling yes, yes. And, and 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 then it becomes universal because anybody I mean, and probably everybody, I loved your introduction. Everybody has a spiritual journey. Everybody has an experience of the divine and particularly when they're suffering it is when often 
that's the, the, the being lifted or held. Um, so I'm really, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, forever grateful for understanding that that's what that, that is, was, mm -hmm. will be. <laughs> Um, which, which is a, a beautiful way of talking about the value and importance of a spiritual life, that you have that way of connecting that then really serves you at these challenging times. And your poem, and I'm sure the piece of art that goes with it, so beautifully um, describe what that that gift is of the spirit yeah uh, absolutely uh joel and honestly i think i have said to, i don't know what people do without a practice when they have this rough road of called life i mean we are all thrown out of the boat and um there are so many yeah and we all have you know friends and family who are struggling with so many things we've had a very challenging uh, last few years with, and I'm going to read this other poem because it's, it's to the point what you're saying. Um, both of you, you know, grief and suffering are gateways to um, surrender. Mm. And um, I think until we really get to that place of not me, you, you know, I cannot hold this and sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's not conscious it's like um you know fall on my knees um so it's what's interesting about this poem i'm going to read um now which is called snowfield for aaron my daughter i had started this poem probably 10 years ago but i didn't know what it was about and it was about grief but i didn't really know so sometimes you know there's a poem lurking out there, you know? but it wasn't until I went through this uh, challenging year with my daughter that um, I could finish this poem. So Snowfield for Aaron. Somewhere across the snowfield of grief, we trudge a trail of aching gray, our heavy silent watch of dark, Ripped from its massive trunk, limbs flung in every direction, branches split, my heart shatters. Not last night's storm, but some other gale rips its way into bark, bone, and flesh. What is found in the snowbank must be taken into my hand, held in my bare palm. Worry. A crust of snow burns like ice. I cannot touch her shoulder, black, thread-stitched, tumor cut out, scarred like the bark of a fallen willow, branded. Stand with her in the middle of nowhere, shiver in this relentless wind while clouds wander off the grid. Once... We walked together among the towering cedars, crawled into the burned out hollow of a virgin redwood. And there's an accompanying image for that as well. Very powerful or beautiful. Really? Really? And you know, truth truth be told, I'm a pretty joyish, happy person. So <laughs> all my poems aren't aren't um, you know aren't touching that place of grief. There's many that are uh, uh, touching just ecstatic joy, and I feel so blessed and um, so um, alive with all of the gifts of um, family and friends and beauty and um, travel and good food and. <laughs> You know the the the, the abundance that's mm -hmm. my cup overflows. Is your daughter doing okay now? Yes, yes, thank goodness. So this was a very serious melanoma, which, as oh. the described, took a, and but she was in treatment for a year, and she's been uh, free now. Um, she'll be watched very carefully for yeah. five years for sure. It's changed her life. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. 
Wow. And ours, but you yes. know, all all in good ways. Yes. Yeah. Well, that certainly speaks strongly to um, the title of our show, "Lifting This Your Spirit." Uh, so it sounds very much like that's what you're getting from your practice, from from your art, from your drawing. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Just finding those places of. Um, you know, where you can touch down. And um, I, and I think for me, um, probably true for everybody, uh, to allow the space, actually to create the space, and, and for silence, for solitude. You know, and our culture doesn't really go there. You know, the culture is like, oh, I'm so busy, you know, and we're coming and we're going. And <laughs> with my first book, The Coming and Going, The Gate of Our Coming and Going. Um, yeah, there's a lot of energy, you know. COVID helped everybody like settle down a little bit, but have you noticed where you are? Certainly here, man, people are like it never happened in some ways. It's like, oh, yippee, you know, it's over. Um, I think yeah. you could relate to that, Joel, from <laughs> what just happened to you down in Provincetown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, what Ted's referring to is um, we're doing this virtually, both of us, because I got a case of COVID, um, thought I escaped the whole experience, but here I am recovering well. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Not glad uh, that you got it. The, uh, uh, I think the lesson is that, you know, the, the return to pre-COVID that you were you know alluding to, Ziggy, was seemed like it was in full flower. You were in a performance venue that was chocked full of people oh and, and it was yeah. indoors oh yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we have been so careful oh it's yeah been a so lot. We... we're off on vacation so, oh this will be fun <laughs> i know right guess what we were the only ones wearing masks of a couple hundred people you wore masks and you still got it yeah yeah it was very tight space. Oh, ouch. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, Jesse and I are making our first big journey uh, on an airplane. <laughs> We're going to Ireland in a few yeah. weeks. And wonderful. I'm, you know, I'm a little, uh, but got to live. Yeah. There's such a strong spiritual history in Ireland. The, um, the sort of Celtic spirituality that my my uncle thomas keating the keating oh, yeah. from ireland and you know yeah. so somehow well, now, i've never been there and but it, now it's like risen to the top of our list so well and i have to say that has also if you can think of all the things that line up to um, <clears throat> your spiritual journey ireland for me as well i have ancestors from ireland but don't know exactly where but i had the privilege of going there um uh, on a writing retreat with David White when John O'Donohue was still wow. alive and spent a day wow. with John O'Donohue. And so wow. I was like, wow. And then on another um, uh, retreat like um, uh, Journey, but Jesse's never been to Ireland and he's a musician, he plays the banjo. And so um, in his retirement. And so I thought, oh, we got to go to Ireland. You got to hear the music. So that's the <clears throat> impetus for this, for this trip. It's wonderful. And we'll get the Holy Wells also. <laughs> So you went, uh, you were on a, on a week long with David White? Yeah, it was actually about 10 days. Wow. What, yeah. what, would, I mean, he is um, kind of such a uh, giant in terms of um, uh, bring, bringing spirituality. I mean, his, his, his yeah. uh, poems are just. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering what that was like. Being... Well, it was, um, it was wonderful. It, I I actually didn't um the structure of it was perfect. I mean, we would get up, we had these little cottages in Bali Vaughan, we'd get up, we'd all convene in one of the little living rooms and there'd be a peat fire going and candles and he would give a talk and he'd invite guest teachers sometimes and then we'd go off in the afternoons and on these hikes and we'd go hike up to a holy well, we'd hike up to the burn, we hiked up to St. Patrick's Bed in the Connemara region and every every day was a kind of a different adventure where he wove in his philosophy and his poetry and one of the days we had john o'donohue came for the morning talk 
And I really didn't know who John Donahue was at the time. This was, you know, 18 years ago or something. And, you know, he, I, he had written on Kara, but, you know, and so he spoke, I was like, who is this person, you know? And then he took us just around the peninsula there or the, the coast was his ancestral home. And we went there for the afternoon and he led us all on a hike. And I remember sitting out there um, on this hillside with our lunches and he's sitting on this big, you know, boulder, granite boulder speaking to us. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this must be what it must have been like at the Sermon on the Mount. You know, wow. there's, everyone's just like leaning in, hanging on every word. I mean, we get these these giant teachers in our lives and, and John and David certainly have been that for me. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, and I actually, this is just fun talking to you. Um, I, I, I had this wonderful uh, experience. I was in my, a studio I was writing and that was kind of stormy and I heard this enormous crash and I thought what in the world and I went next door and it turns out a tree a huge Monterey pine tree had laid itself down between the garage and the house of my neighbor and the first thing I said to myself was some giant has fallen mm. and I came back to my studio and within a half an hour there was an email to the group that had been with David and and John saying John O'Donohue died last night. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that, I mean, yes. you know, this is, this, everything's holy. Yes. Yes. And, and that that's for me, it gets revealed in, in what some people would refer to as a coincidence. For me, it's like a, a, um, a, a, a portal into the underlying reality of things it's like sort of a gift in that way yeah these these are and i love in the zen tradition you know um beings are numberless i vow to save them um delusions are inexhaustible i vow to end them dharma gates are boundless i vow to enter them mm. buddha's way is unsurpassable i vow to become it mm. so this notion that dharma gates are everywhere you know Yes. It's holy wants to be revealed to us everywhere, all the time, without stopping. That's so beautifully expressed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That might be a good note to end on here. That's yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. Sure is. Sure is. Okay. Could you say it one more time? Um beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it. Beautiful. Thank you. And right. Thank you for sharing today. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. And um, I will look forward to uh, people learning more about my book. And I know you put some information on your website or whatever about how you can get a hold of it. Yes, we sure will. Okay. Yeah. All right. Blessings to you both. So um, just then with sharing that uh, anybody who would like to view this program after it appears, which will be the third week in August, uh, third Wednesday in August, 1130 at the Media Hub site, um, can go to um, NewburyportMediaHub.org and go to the upper right corner, the YouTube icon, and it will be there along with our previous shows or the SoundCloud um, icon and be able to listen to it and previous shows there. Thank you for viewing today and I hope your spirits are lifted as mine has been listening to Ziggy. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much.